Good afternoon. My name is Seth Butner, and I have the honor to serve as this year's president of Rotary Club of Oakland. Founded in 1908, the Rotary Club of Oakland is the third oldest Rotary Club of some 35,000 Rotary Clubs throughout the world. We are a community of 300 men and women from all walks of Oakland civic life, commercial, community life, committed to the Rotary motto of service above self. I'd like to welcome you to the 5,339th club meeting for 111 years, we have welcomed Rotarians and guests from around the world to our club meetings. We continue to do so virtually and soon right here from the California Ballroom again. That's right, today we're here in the California Ballroom and uh, we're coming to you live from the California Ballroom. Many thanks to the AV team, Jack Isles and Sandeep Nayak who had worked tirelessly to try to get us back into this mode. But today we're doing another test, just like we did last week, and hopefully everything will come out well, but bear with us a little bit. So if you're visiting Rotarian, or if you're a guest of a Rotarian, please let us know by typing your name and the name of your club into the chat box located at the center bottom of the screen that you're viewing now. By doing so, we will be able to recognize you later in the meeting. Also, we recommend that all participants view this Zoom meeting by clicking the speaker view button located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And if you have questions or comments throughout the meeting, uh, you can put those in the speaker, use the chat button at the bottom of the screen for that as well. And now for the doc for the day, Rotarian Isaac Kasri. I thought you were going to be here, but we'll go to you now on Zoom. Thank you, President. Yes, and I have a good excuse for not being there because my guest here with me is actually my mother, um, Diana Koss, an artist who lives here on Lake Merritt with me in Oakland. So the thought for the day I have is actually a poem about uh, my mom and mothers. And after searching for uh, great poems online and not finding one that really encapsulated how I felt, I decided I'd write my own. So at the risk of embarrassing my mom just a little bit, I'm going to read a poem that I wrote. Mom, three short letters to describe the beginning, the womb, the birth, the building of years, generations of love, mumbled in every language, mama, Mama, man, um, mama, mamo, mama. Quiet rumblings of the mother tongue. May we honor you like mother earth, replenishing, relinquishing, vulnerably, revisiting the measure, the model you are for us. I'm sorry for not doing more. Forgive me, mom, I love you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for that uh, thought for the day, Isaac. Uh, coming off Mother's Day, and uh, we had Mexican Mother's Day, because my wife is Mexican. I had to shout out for that one as well <laughs> on uh, Monday the 10th. Uh, but thank you so much for that, Isaac. Really appreciate it. Because we want to remain grounded and focused, we begin our meetings by jointly reciting our vision, which is together we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. I hope you enjoyed uh, last week's meeting where we had a fascinating discussion on the movies. This week we have further testing in the ballroom and uh, we're gonna have a few other little announcements and guests that surprise us to uh, make the evening go, the afternoon go well. So sit back, enjoy another great Civic Thursday meetings where you can <clears throat> a great speaker and get involved with Rotary where self-service above self exists. Past District Governor Ed Jellin, do we have any visiting Rotarians or guests? Indeed we do, uh, President Sess. So we have some very special guests with us here today. Uh, first, uh, we have Diane Dorn, uh, who's the past president of the Rotary Club of San Leandro. Always nice to have you with us, uh, Diane, welcome. 
Uh, we have some guests that are so special that I'm not even going to introduce them because they're going to be introduced later in the uh, in the program. But I can tell you that they're from uh, Medellin, Colombia, and they are Rotarians. Uh, we've already welcomed uh, Isaac's mom. Uh, so once again, uh, welcome uh, Diana Koss. Nice to have you with us. And finally, we have uh, another guest of Isaac, Antoine Adams, who is uh, one of our Cerrone Lina scholars, and he's got an internship with uh, Isaac. So Antoine, nice to have you with us. Welcome to Rotary. And that's our guest lineup for today, President Sess. Well, thank you, Ed, and welcome to all guests. And now, from those special guests that we had, Rotarian Michael Brook, past president Michael Brook, I should say, first. Uh, thank, thank you, President Sess. Uh, Karen Friedman and I are here today to welcome our special guest, Erica Arista Zabel, who's a visiting Rotarian from the Nuevo Medellin Rotary Club. She's actually here in San Francisco with us. And before we do that, I want to remind everybody of our annual international service trip to Medellin, Colombia. Oakland Rotary members and guests visited Medellin in both 2018 and 2019. And we almost got there last year, but had to cancel because of the pandemic. We're planning to return to Medellin, uh, we hope next year, 2022 in the spring. Uh, our itinerary includes uh, hands-on service projects, meeting with the Rotarians from the many Medellin area Rotary Clubs, uh, touring the beautiful uh, city of Medellin, uh, sampling Colombian food, and even some salsa dancing. Uh, Medellin's uh, about 5,000 foot elevation. It's, uh, the weather is, is pleasant and it's a great place to visit. Um, our trips are designed just for our members and their guests. It's a unique experience. Uh, you won't find anywhere else. Uh, we will provide some more specifics about the trip later, later this year, probably in the fall. Uh, but free, feel free to contact me or Karen if you have any questions. Uh, and now here's Karen to introduce our special guest. Okay, Karen. Hello, everybody. Um, I have the privilege of introducing Erica. I have got to look at her name, Aristizabal of uh, Medellin, Colombia. As Michael said, she's been traveling around the United States and she's currently joining us from San Francisco. Um, we, have, we have a special relationship with two of the eight Medellin clubs and Erica is a member of the Nuevo Medellin Club. It's, she's been a member for three years, she's been a Rotarian for five years, and she's very, very active in the Community Service Committee. This is an incredibly active club. They have many projects going at one time, and we, our club has helped, has helped sponsor and fund some of their many projects. Um, also, I want to say that Erica is an attorney, and she's a criminal court judge in Medellin. So I'm going to give the mic over to um, Erica so she can describe the special relationship but give us some insight into the special relationship that we have with them from their perspective. But also I want to say hello to all of our friends who are on this call from Medellin and hello and thanks for being here. Erica. Uh, you mute. Hello. Yeah. Yes, hello everybody. I want to say hello to all of you, my name is Erika Ristizabal. I come from Colombia, come from Medellin. Uh, it's a pleasure to me to be here. Uh, thanks for being so special. <laughs> I'm not I'm a special guest. You are the special guest. You are always welcome in Medellin. Many of you have been there for us. It's uh, so uh, glad to, to, to come with this club. We are so thankful about all the support and help that you have provided us uh, for a long time about programs, activities, and projects. So um, no, I think uh, I'm not a special. You are the special that had support us to change the life of many people. For us, it's a special relationship, and uh, and we're so 
proud to be uh, linked with a club with uh, with the, this bigger uh, as bigger as you are. So no, that's all. Uh, I want to. I want. I only want to say thank you in the, in the name of my club to you. And thank I hope you. That see you the next year there. Thank you, Erica. We're so glad to have you come visit us, and we also look forward to the trip down there when we can all join in the service project to help you out with this. Uh, as you know, earlier in the year, we partnered with the Salvation Army to uh, deliver hygiene kits to folks in Oak, uh, homeless in Oakland. Today, we have some guests from Salvation Army, Major James Sullivan, Divisional Secretary of Alameda County for Salvation Army. James. Hello, Sess. It's, it's nice to be with you today and to be with the club uh, virtually. We want to say thank you to the Oakland Rotary Club for all your hard work working with the homeless in Oakland and partnering with the Salvation Army. We had a fantastic team of about 14 people come over on a Saturday morning to, to put together a thousand uh, uh, hygiene kits to be distributed to the homeless. And then we, I think we had five or six people on the distribution. And so you guys and, and ladies went along with us and passed out those a thousand kits to the homeless and it brought joy and made a difference in their lives. The Salvation Army is continuing to serve mobile meals in Oakland. We've been doing it now for 14 months and we've served over 80,000 meals to the homeless. In fact, in July, we're looking on transitioning our mobile meals delivery team into a homeless mobile outreach team to not only give a meal, but give a hand up and help them to get out of their homeless situation. So we'd like to present to you the certificate of appreciation um, to the Open Rotary for your participation in the Salvation Army Homeless Hygiene Project. And we also wanna give you a doing the most good Salvation Army Cup. Thank you Rotarians for helping the Salvation Army to help the homeless, God bless you. Let's give them a round of applause. The Thank Salvation you. Army. We really appreciate it. Well, Thank, Thank you, Salvation Army. Uh, I was uh, looking through my mailbox this week, and all of a sudden I got a little letter that said, uh, magazine from Piedmont Living. Do we have that? Put that up on the screen, uh, Sandy, if we got that. Yeah, it's Piedmont Living. And that's our very own Rotarian, Gail Local. Gail, do you have something to say about all of this? What's that about? Well, thank you very much. It's, it was an honor to be featured in this, um, in this edition. And I certainly talked about Rotary and what a meaningful part uh, Rotary is of my life. And in honor of that article, I'd like to ring the bell. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> the bell. My pleasure. Oh, I got another bell ring from Karen Friedman. And another bell ring from Dudley Thompson in the audience. <laughs> Do, we might have some more. So if you have some more, put them in the chat and uh, we'll see how uh, it goes. I thank you so much uh, for sharing your experience with us. I didn't have to go on Broad Street, but I did anyway, Gail. Thank you. Unanimous bell ring won't come. Uh, Robert Kidd, I think you have an announcement for us to tell us about an event that was supposed to happen this week. Robert Kidd. Well, well thank you, Sess. And please let it be noted that I have unmuted before I tried to speak. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the High Adventure Committee had scheduled a hike for this Sunday uh, on Mount Diablo. Uh, we haven't had quite the turnout we had hoped for, so we're gonna have to cancel the event. So no hike this Sunday. Uh, High Adventure will be rescheduling this event later in the summer. I look forward to Rotarians joining us at that time. Sess, thank you. No, no event this Sunday, but look forward to it in the future. This is what's happening to us in the COVID year. We've had limited amounts of time that we could do our service. We were fortunate enough to have the situation that we did with the Salvation Army and the hygiene kids. Whenever we get an opportunity, we got to take the opportunity to do our service projects so we can do. 
and events that we can do as well. Rotarian Jesse Smith, I think you have an announcement for us on uh, Business Development Committee. I sure do. Thank you, President Sess, Rotarians and guests. The dictionary defines inflation as the action of inflating something with a gas or the condition of being inflated with a gas. Oh, wait, hold on. There's a second definition of inflation, and that's a general increase in prices and fall in the purchasing value of money. Now, it's very important to know the difference between these two things. And if you're as confused as I am, or if you're just looking to learn about inflation, about the economic comings and goings of our country, then you're really going to want to check out the Business Development Committee's free Zoom event next Thursday, a week from today, May 20th, at 5 p.m. featuring Oakland Rotarian Devo Sarkar, who is the Charles Schwab Managing Director. So again, next Thursday, 5 p.m., free event on Zoom, hosted by the Business Development Committee and Debo Sarkar. Hope to see you there. Thank you for that announcement. Now to remind us of the culmination of our fundraising campaign this year and the gala event, Rotarian Kathleen Sims. Hello, all Rotarians, how are you today? We did wanna remind you about the gala, which is a week and a half away. And to start off, we wanted to let you know about our fun wine cellar raffle. The odds are great. We're only selling them uh, inside the meetings online. You can call Jesse, you can email Jesse, but um, it's a great chance to win about 20 to 25 bottles of wine and a wine chest, the wine cooler to go with it. So we hope you sign up. You can sign up here in the chat. So we'll be looking for your signups for that. We also wanted to remind you about our annual fun raising gala. It's on Saturday, May 22nd, and we're bringing the fun directly into your house via Zoom. Our night of giving features the auctioneer, the celebrity auctioneer, Liam McClain, and a chef and mixologist, Nigel Jones of um, Kingston 11. Can't wait for that and music, magic, and comedy from curated entertainment. And finally, the exciting casino games and the enticing live and silent auctions. Doors open at 6 p.m. There'll be a little mix and mingle, but the tables open at 6.30. The entertainment opens at 6.30. Tickets are available until Wednesday that's next Wednesday, um, and we hope you sign up. The tickets are $100 or $150 for our high rollers. The high rollers get a few more chips than the basic entry. Are there any questions from anybody? Anybody done a virtual casino party? No? We questions? Should... Yeah? <laughs> if we got any questions, put them in the chat, and we'll make sure we respond to them. But main thing is for everybody to get your gala ticket and purchase a wine raffle ticket to help us celebrate our successful campaign, which we raised about $120,000 so far. Where do you go buy a ticket? The, the, we got a uh, message coming out to you from Jesse, and it will have a link for bidding now where you can go buy, purchase the ticket and go directly to our site on our website as well. Do you have any other questions from the big audience that we have here locally? <laughs> uh, here, no. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. Well, yeah. we'll see everybody at that sounds like fun. We'll have a great time at the gala event this year. Our last one, hopefully, that we'll do virtually. Maybe we can do them in person next time around. Um, Rotarian, Julaine Virgil, will you do us the honor of introducing this week's Civic Thursday speaker? I would love to, President Sess. Reshma Sajani is a leading activist and founder of Girls Who Code and the Marshall Plan for Moms. She spent more than a decade building movements to fight for women and girls' economic empowerment, working to close the gender gap in the tech sector, 
and most recently advocating for policies to support moms impacted by the pandemic. Reshma is also the author of international bestseller, Brave, Not Perfect, and her influential TED Talk, Teach Girls Bravery, Teach Girls Bravery, Not per Perfection, that has more than 5 million views globally. Reshma began her career as an attorney and democratic organizer. And in 2010, she surged onto the political scene as the first Indian American woman to run for US Congress. Reshma lives in New York City with her husband, their sons, and their bulldog, and we're so glad that she's joining us today at Oakland Rotary Number 3 to talk to us about her work. Reshma. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely. We are, we are glad to have you. Um, and so would you, we want to hear more about, um, you've, you've been working on so much lately. So um, can you talk, start talking to us maybe about how you've approached motherhood and maternity leave? Yes. So I, um, before I launched the Marshall Plan for Moms, my full-time job was the CEO and founder of Girls Who Code. Um, it was my life's work. And when I started 2020, uh, I started it on a high. Uh, my newborn baby was about to arrive. I'd had a baby via surrogate. Um, so I was really, really looking forward to, the, to taking maternity leave for the first time and really enjoying that time with him. You know, Girls Who Code was just rocking. You know, we started the year with a Super Bowl ad and we were going to teach more girls than we ever had, more under girls than, underserved girls than we ever had before. Um, and so I was excited. And then a few weeks after my son was born, COVID-19 happened. And I found myself having to cancel my maternity leave, uh, to, uh, going back to work full time to save my global nonprofit because when pandemics hit, the first resources to go are ones to women and girls. And I had to homeschool my five-year-old. I got COVID-19, but it barely registered. My liver failed. I had acne in my face as if I was 16 years old. And every night I was just done. And as I looked on my Zoom screen, every mother looked exactly how I felt. And I think for so many of us in the beginning of the pandemic, we were simply just grinning and bearing it. And many of us thought, well, when the schools open in September, when the schools open in September, things will go back to normal. And when the schools didn't open, and my son's in public school here in New York City, and I got noticed two weeks before that schools weren't going to open, and a bunch of male legislators had come up with this idea of hybrid learning, where I would have to log on my son at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and 12 o'clock, all the while maintaining my full-time job, and that nobody even asked me it terrified me and it terrified so many women that I knew that someone could make a decision that so disastrously could affect you. And then we saw the implications of these choices, right? Um, five million women left the workforce and women were leaving the workforce for two reasons, not out of choice, they were being pushed out. And the first reason was, was because schools weren't open and we didn't have affordable, reliable childcare, they had no choice because many women were forced to go on food stamps, move in with their parents, you know, take the third shift at work, and they couldn't afford childcare. They couldn't bring their grandparents or their parents back into their home. Daycare centers were shut down. They literally had no choices. You know, the LA City Council president told me that women were literally bringing their children to the park in LA and saying, please help me. There was so much desperation happening that women had no cho choice but to leave the workforce. The second reason that women were leaving was because many women, especially women of color, found themselves in jobs that weren't pandemic proof, like retail, healthcare, you know, education, jobs that weren't coming back. And we know that 70% of households in America um, that are run by you know, single breadwinners are run by women of color. And so when they lose their job, the entire family suffers. And so, in those December months when, you know, the jobs report came out and all the jobs lost for women, I said, where's the plan? Like, where's the plan? Someone's got to have a plan. We've lost too many jobs too quickly. And so when I didn't see a plan, I wrote an op-ed called the We Need a Marshall Plan for Moms. And since then, we've built a movement, a campaign, uh, really around this idea that in order to shorten the economic recovery for mothers, they need support. 
That is um, incredible. And can you tell us a little bit more about the Marshall Plan for Moms? What is it for those who haven't heard about it, who don't know about it? What is the Marshall Plan for Moms? What does it entail? And how do you think it will help uh, speed up the economic recovery? Yeah, so I wrote it up in December. And then in February, we took out a full page ad to President Biden saying, moms don't work for free. And we're not America's social safety net. And here are the things we need. And, you know, we listed out, you know, four or five main things. The first thing was basic income payments to mothers. Every mom I talked to, she needed cash because every mom's situation was not the same. Some moms needed money to pay the rent, to put food on the table, you know, to pay for that tutor, but they needed cash so that they don't have to continue to supplement their paid labor for unpaid labor. And cash would really help that. That has now come in the form of the child, child tax credit. Uh, which is essentially a $300 check you're going to get in July from the government every month to use as you see fit, um, again, for the things that I had mentioned. The second thing we called on in February was to offer paid leave and affordable child care. You know, we are one of the few nations that doesn't offer paid leave. Most women of color in this country or, or low-income women in this country go back to work after two weeks of having birth. You know, if you think about in those early months in January, February, if our American fellow citizens had paid leave, so many of them, we wouldn't have lost as many of our brothers and sisters. You know, so not offering paid leave is unconscionable. It's the same thing with affordable childcare. So many mothers, so many parents, or so many mothers, I should say, are forced, you know, to, to not go into the, the workforce or to go into the workforce, you know, at levels that they don't want to be at because childcare is just not affordable. You know, my parents were refugees and my dad couldn't afford the $50 a week for childcare. And so I was a latchkey kid. And so, so many parents today are asked to make, again, inhumane choices between their job and their children. And so we need to offer childcare in this country. The, the, the other thing that I had, we had proposed was, you know, opening schools five days a week safely. You know, today I'm pleased to see that, you know, Randy Weingarten you know, from the American Federation of Teachers has also agreed that schools got to open because mothers cannot go back to work, period, unless schools open safely. And finally, you know, going back to all of those women and all those women of color that lost their jobs because they were in jobs that weren't pandemic proof, where's the plan to retrain them? Where's the plan to retrain them? You know, because they are counting they want to work. They need to work. They don't have a choice. And so if these jobs aren't going to be open, we need to come up with a, a countrywide plan to put them back to work so that they can march back up into the middle class. That makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like, I mean, the pandemic caused, caused new issues, but also shone a light on issues that had long been existing. Um, these are not necessarily new things that you're talking about. It just kind of exacerbated existing inequities. That, that's right. I mean, the thing that's kind of frightening, though, is that, you know, when we started the pandemic, it was the first time in the history of our nation that women were 51% of the labor force. Today, our labor market participation is where it was in 1989. We lost so many jobs so fast, 30 years of progress gone in nine months. So it showed that this, the, the foundation was unstable. Women were always just barely holding on, right? And something like a pandemic just took them off the rails. And so, yes, and I think it's just, you know, again, you know, if we're really using crises to think about how do we rebuild this country back better? How do we build America back better? Well, I ask, how do we build motherhood back better? You know, for far too long, other nations have social safety nets, we have moms, you know, and our, the, our labor has been so unvalued, unrecognized, unseen, especially our labor in the home, you know, and I argue, and I have a book coming out about this, is that, you know, unless we have gender justice in the home, unless we get to 50-50 in the home, we're never going to get to 50-50 in the workplace. And as we think about hybrid working, right, the new normal that's about to come up, I am terrified of what it's going to do to the motherhood penalty. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, for example, it's not enough to offer a benefit because that doesn't mean that there will be equality in taking that benefit. So for example, you know, some companies offer paid leave to both mothers and fathers, but in America, I think less than 7% of American dads take paid leave. And so for so many companies like in tech or in finance, you know, they want to hire the guy that goes to little league, but then you take three months leave and they're like, what's wrong with you, right? 
you're not seen as productive work. It's, it's, it's again, goes back to kind of toxic masculinity. So what we didn't do is what other nations have done, for example, in Norway or even in Canada, where you know, you're offered a year of paid leave to both parents, whether, whether they're heterosexual, whether they're a same-sex couple, right? And you both have to take it. And if you both don't take it, you lose it. So we really, we really had, we're very thoughtful in thinking about design for equality, right? And not just simply offering a benefit. Now, the same thing is we have to think about in terms of flexibility and remote working, right? We already know what's happening right now. And in every study that's been seen, mothers in particular want flexibility. Dads want to be in the office five days a week, right? And so what's happening now as a preview in many companies is that the moms are at home and we're kind of doing our laundry as I just was in between my Zoom calls and getting the groceries and you know our to-do lists have gotten bigger. And so we want that flexibility to do all things. But be, you know, for fathers, they're like, I'm out of here, right? And they want to go into the workplace because they're not taking on the extra labor at home. And so as far as I'm concerned, I think we have to really think about when we design these policies, when we welcome parents back to the workplace, how are we designing them so we are making sure that we are fostering or encouraging a change in the ratio of who's doing what at home. Makes sense. And we've got a question about uh, if you could define toxic mas masculinity. <laughs> I'm going to let you take a break there with a get your water break because we've <laughs> kind of been going here. But we do have a question about uh, defining toxic masculinity. Yeah, I think what I mean by here is that, you know, there is a very kind of American cultural norm on how we think boys and men should behave. You know, God blessed me with two sons. And I see this all the time with my firstborn, who is literally like a walking Gandhi. You know, I, I, I talked a lot about bravery and perfection and about how we teach our boys to climb from the monkey bars and just jump. But with our girls, we're like, be careful, honey, don't swing too high. Well, I have a son who's not jumping from any monkey bars. And every day I just watch people try to quote, man him up and try to toughen him up. And I'm, as his mother, have to protect him to let him be just who he is. And, you know, I think there are dads who want to take on some of that caretaking responsibility, but we don't have a culture that really encourages that and supports that. So what are we doing? You know, most company, most countries, when they announced parental leave, they also had a uh, public, you know, public service campaign that went along with it, you know, to really shift and change behavior. I was talking to these amazing women in the Philippines and they, you know, had this whole campaign around laundry is love and doing laundry with your partner is about expressing love. Can you imagine having that campaign here? You know what I mean? In America, um, we need it. We have to. And so um, for me, it's about how do you shift cultural norms away from encouraging toxic masculinity? That's really interesting. Um, and you mentioned previously that uh, you took out a full page ad in the New York Times and that was followed up uh, that in that full page ad, there was one that was signed by, you know, 50 prominent female allies. And then it was followed up by a full page ad in the Washington Post signed by 50 prominent male allies. And so, you know, kind of following on the conversation about toxic masculinity and that necessary shift in the culture, yeah. you know, how would you, how do you think about, um, the role that men can play um, in, in, in helping to change this culture? Huge role. I mean, that campaign was led by Steph Curry and some of the most prominent athletes, you know, in the world because they see the role that their partners did, that their mothers did. They see the inequity, right? They see the trivialization of motherhood in our culture. And I think it is, I've always built movements that have included men and that have encouraged men to stand in my sisterhood. I mean, at Girls Who Code, 40% of Girls Who Code's teachers are men. You know, some of my fiercest, half my board are men. You know, some of the fiercest parents in our community are dads because they are, they are fully committed to creating a world where their daughters can be everything and anything. And they see in the dimming of their daughter's light how culture plays such a huge impact, you know, on these things and that they have a role in shifting this. You know, I gave a speech, um, a couple of speeches, you know, before COVID about what does bravery mean to men? 
And, you know, I remember one of um, the most powerful examples I had a couple of years ago is I had want, went to visit the Rochester Institute of Technology. And at RIT, they had shifted dramatically the number of young women graduating in computer science. And so I wanted to visit the school to learn about what they had done. And I went there and I went to go speak to the women in computing group. And as I was speaking to these young women, I noticed a handful of boys that were sitting in the back. And at first I thought that they had like come to like, you know, I don't know, mess with me or something, right? And I went up to them afterwards and I said, well, who are you? And they said, well, we're the men who support the women in computing group. They had formed a club inside a club. And what they told me was so powerful. They said, you know, we know that the women in our industry have it tougher than us in tech. And so we feel like it is our obligation to stand up for them and fight. So when there's a microaggression made in a classroom, we say something. When we come back from an interview at Google, we tell them, hey, this is what to expect. You know, when we're sitting in a classroom and we know that 80% of men talk more than women, we're just, you know, count to 100 before we say something. We give women an opportunity to be brave. And, you know, to me, that was powerful. And I've been kind of telling that story over and over and over again, because a lot of men say, well, what, can, what should I do? What can I do? And I think that there are real kind of tactics and strategies to, you know, to, to stand in sisterhood and to fight alongside, you know, for equality and equity. So you've talked a little bit about the individuals. I think we, we've got some questions coming in too that I want to make sure we, we get to you. Um, what, how else do you think businesses should be stepping up and making sure that they're supporting their employees? Because uh, obviously that some jobs have disappeared completely. Yeah. Um, some jobs are impossible to do while you're also juggling, you know, children at home, not in school. Um, can you talk a little bit about more how how businesses can can be supportive? We have a lot of business uh, owners here and business leaders. Absolutely. So I want to hear well, more about that. We're going to be putting out a Marshall Plan for Moms at Work playbook. Uh, in July. And so we're doing a very intense study and survey right now, both of moms and businesses to say, well, what do you need as we go back to the new normal in September? And businesses are like, what are you doing? And so, you know, you know, a, a couple of ideas is, is look, I, I think that businesses can actually lead on this. And, and here's a couple of ways. First is in the way that you offer benefits. So I do think that companies should be held accountable or should encourage accountability for taking paid leave and for offering paid leave, you know? And so if we want to encourage equality in the home, we have to encourage, you know, male employees to be equal partners. And we already know, right, that the evidence is clear that that early education, that early touch, that early involvement of parents is key to children living longer, being healthier, staying in the workforce. It is good for society, right? So, so I think businesses have to encourage that behavior. I love these ideas of offering, you know, a one year take it or lose it, you know, having performance evaluations based on whether you took your paid leave, like, you know, all of those things really encouraging it and signaling that this is a corporate value. You know what I mean? You showing up at home is a corporate value. Because as we, as I, as you know, 80% of the housework in American homes are done by women. And so, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not taking that promotion because I don't have a mentor or a sponsor. I'm not taking that promotion because I don't have time. I'm exhausted. And so we've spent so much time in corporate feminism focusing on the workplace, but we haven't focused on the home. And I think that there's an a role for the private sector to play in shifting the responsibilities at the home. And I want them to be laser focused and thinking about how they do that. So one, I think benefits, and we talked about remote work and flexibility. You know, the other thing is the motherhood penalty. You know, my inbox is full of emails from moms that are being gaslighted right now because of their caretaking responsibilities. You know, whether it's a mom who works at Target, who said to her boss, listen, I got to go pick up my laptop for my son because he needs a remote schooling and she got fired. You know, or a mom who, who said to me, wrote me a note and said, you know, I didn't get this promotion. And my boss had told me that my son was interrupting me too many times in my Zoom meetings and it wasn't professional. And I know that's why I didn't get it. So, you know, we don't really have caregiver protections in, that are seated in the law right now. Um, and so we have got to figure out how we protect, you know, especially right now, listen, as much as we as much as this breaks my heart, you know, our kids lost a year of learning 
And many of them are just broken. My son's been, just eats his shirt. He's more anxious than I've ever seen him be. And so my attention is very much on him right now. And I think a lot of mothers feel that way. And so next year, it's not an on and off switch. You know, we're going we're gonna to be spending more time with our children as we should, both parents. And so we need to make sure that suddenly, you know, there's, that's not, we're not being discriminated against. I mean, you just heard last week, Jamie Diamond say, I did my last Zoom meeting. You know, David Solomon say, everyone's coming back to the workplace. Well, what, is, what are you saying to me then when I'm on Zoom? Right. So the, the point is, is that we cannot, we not, you know, we can't create two states where we're going to allow flexibility, but really what we're saying is don't take flexibility. And when you're that one zoom box and your kid zoom bombs you a lot of zooms here, you know, you're not paying, paying a price for that already. We know that mothers make 25 cents less than every dollar made my dad's and that the pay gap is not because of uh, people who don't bear children but between mothers and fathers. There already was a motherhood penalty. Now that penalty just got bigger. And then the, and the last point I wanna say is, listen, I want private sector companies to subsidize childcare, period. Why are you giving me money to freeze my eggs, but you're not helping me in taking care of my children? Again, when the evidence is clear. So you can't do one and not the other. And so I think we have to have a long, hard conversation about the types of benefits we're going to be offering parents on caregiving, not just for their children, but their elderly parents. And I'll say this, you know, as someone who's 45 and who have a 13 month old and a six year old, I also have two 80 year old parents. The amount of time that I spent trying to get them a vaccine, every mom I know, same, every woman I know, again, that taking care of elderly parents often falls to women in our society. And so that's another layer, right, that we're, we're that we're facing and that we're that we're having to experience. And again, if we are a society that takes care of our children and that takes care of our elderly, we have to support people, the state and the private sector has to support people in fulfilling that moral obligation. Definitely resonates over here. Um, so I'm gonna go through the chat. There's a couple of questions here. And I don't know if you wanna get some water while I pull up, we've got a question from Teresa. Um, do you find the significance in, or do you find significance in the large percentage of women legislators in Iceland, Norway, Finland, and Sweden contributing to paid child leave, excellent schools, and the closing the, closing the gender gap in pay? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're focused on it because they feel it and they experience it. You know, the average legislator, I think, in Congress is a 69-year-old man, you know, um, and so he's not, he doesn't understand what moms went through this year. I think just people just don't really get it. And so we have to tell them, I mean, it, 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 it blows my mind. I still, I still can't, it's, it's, it's just really painful to think about. I mean, the fact that again, when we thought about how to design schools that no one ever asked us and that we assumed that there was gonna be a default caretaker and that person was a woman and we still see droves and droves and droves of women who are literally pushed out of the workforce. You know, part of what I'm trying to do too is, you know, we, we sometimes become, you know, desensitized to these numbers, 5 million, 3 million, 2 million. But I, you know, I want people to ask, well, who are these women? What were their dreams? What do they want to do? You know, and, and understand how, you know, this pandemic was, didn't treat all parents equally, right? It didn't, you know, the last jobs report, we, we had men added 355,000 jobs, mothers lost 165,000, you know? And so it's not the same. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, why is that? And like, why are we as a society still not prioritizing, you know, supporting them in this moment? Why are we not censoring mothers in the middle of this economic recovery still when we know what is happening to them? And we know how dire it is and that every day a mom is being asked to either go on food stamps, move in with her car, become homeless, not be able to pay her children, not be able to buy her children's, you know, asthma medication. Every single day a mom is being forced to make these unconscionable choices and we still are not passing this legislation and getting this support. Boggles my mind. You know, everyone, sorry, one last, everyone in the last jobs report was like, oh, I don't know what happened. I thought we were supposed to have more jobs. I'm like, 
because moms are still at home because the schools are not open. You know, what, what do you mean? What is a surprise? Right? Again, we were 51% of the labor force. We were the majority of the labor force, but we are America's default caretaker. Those two things cannot coexist, you know, and I think we've learned that. Absolutely. So we have a question from Keith. What can we do as Rotarians as individuals to make the Marshall Plan a reality? Ah, well, I think that we, look, we have got to have a plan. And I think first, we all have to get behind the America Family Plan. I think the Biden administration has really put forth something. I'm nervous. You know, yesterday I heard in Congress, they were calling it your home health proposal. And so like we have to, this is a bipartisan issue. You know, the, the families, American families is a bipartisan issue. And I think we have an opportunity to fix and change structures once and for all. You know, for those of you that are on the, in the business community, I, I've talked to so many CEOs who are, are not planning yet. And I'm like, no, 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 you got to plan. We're coming. You know what I mean? This is happening. Like, I need you to plan. And I'm happy to talk to anybody, you know, and when the Marshall Plan for Moms report comes out, I want to share it with you. But start talking and surveying people and thinking about it and figuring out what you can do. I always, what I used to do at Girls Who Code is I would build for my most vulnerable student. So I would go to refugee camps, you know, um, on the border, Jordan, and I would say, how do I teach her to code? Poor, no Wi-Fi. You know what I mean? How do I teach her? If I can figure out to teach her, I can teach anyone. If you could build a workforce for mothers, for mothers of color, every employee will benefit. So, you know, start asking yourself that question now and, and, and start making a commitment that that's the kind of workforce that you want to build. Uh, that's the kind of support that you want to offer, you know, and finally, it's really shifting this, you know, cultural conversation. I saw somebody like, I couldn't even find a poem for Mother's Day. <laughs> I mean, wow, right? It's like, we, I, again, you know, I always say that we love our moms, we don't like motherhood. And so we have got to really, and I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times this week about this idea, um, you know, of unpaid labor and, you know, what we need to do, I, please read it, please, you know, start having these, com and it's, 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 you know, you look at the comment section and it was rich, right? It was, you know, because there's a lot of feelings about this. You know, some people feel, well, mother, it's a choice. You don't get nice things because you chose. And then some people say, well, I don't know if I want to give moms things because then they won't go back into the workplace. And sometimes our only worth is in the workplace. So we have, it is a very, ironically, who would have thought, you know what I mean? It's a very controversial, complicated, cultural conversation that we need to have, you know? Absolutely. And I appreciate you being here with us to share this conversation. Um, I want to open it up if anyone has a question that they didn't want to type in the chat, but they, they want to ask. We've got a lot of rich comments in the chat too, but if anyone wants to ask, and including folks really appreciating this conversation that we're having right now. Um, I, I put this question in the chat. I have a daughter who's 31, and I just want to know what else we can do to make sure that should she choose to become a mom, how can the world be better for her? I mean, we need to start like right today. 100%. But, um, it, you know, it's a big 100%. Thank you so much for that question. I, um, you know, there's all last week, the news was full of articles about how our birth rates have declined the lowest in ever in 50 years, right? 500,000 less births. And the young women who work for me and work with me, they don't want kids. They're like, it's too hard. It's too expensive. And I, I don't, we don't want to become like Japan. And so I think that, you know, in Norway, like you have a baby, they give you milk and diapers right? It's like you have paid leave, you have affordable, you get a, you get a, you know, family allowance. So we have got to shift the culture, you know, about this kind of very individualist, you're on your own thing, because I just think these young women, these young families, they're too smart. They're just not going to do it. They're not going to be the martyrs that many of us were. And so we've got to fight for these policies. And, and look, a lot of people say to me, well, I don't have kids. Why should I care? Why should my tax dollars go to it? Or my kids are grown. It doesn't affect me anymore. But, you know, listen, this, it does matter I mean, the fabric and the health of society is one that is able to produce itself and to produce the next generation. And so like, it is fundamental, you know, 
to the longevity of our culture, our health and our society. So we all got to get in, and we all got to get behind this and really push for it. Isaac uh, has his hand up. Uh, Isaac, do you have a question? Yeah, I have been, uh, I was an early fan of Andrew Yang and in part because of him bringing UBI to the forefront. And I'm curious if you see an intersection between UBI and the Marshall Plan and motherhood. An extra credit if I get to hear your thoughts on Andrew Yang <laughs> as mayor of New York. <laughs> I'm not going there. Um, I, well, first <laughs> of all, I love, I love my city and I'm excited to have leadership. Uh, and it's a very most interesting race I think we've seen in a long time. Uh, and I've known Andrew for a, for a long time. And he was one of the men who signed my 50, 50, 50 male advocate letter. So look, I think that there's a, there's a connection obviously between UBI and, and basic income payments for mothers. One of the things though that I'm arguing and interested in, and this wasn't the work that I was actually focused on. So I'm also kind of nerding out about learning about the history behind this is really about, uh, and this is what my time's up at is about, is really about valuing unpaid labor. So it's not giving moms money to not work, it's giving moms money for their work that is not valued. Um, so, you know, even this childcare tax credit that is gonna be, that is going through, that was revolutionary because before we used to tie, quote, welfare to work and you only got benefits if you were working. And this benefit says, well, as having a child, you deserve something um, because that is un that that labor. And I, and I talk about this many times. I mean, that labor, if we were to give women minimum wage, you know, for the unpaid labor that they do in the home, that is one point five trillion dollars. You know, there was you know, a whole piece in what's happening in Argentina, what's happening in India. There's a whole movement across the globe uh, to start putting unpaid labor into the GDP. So we start valuing it. So that's a little, you know, bit of a shift, right, on this idea of UBI, because UBI is for anybody, whether you're working or not working, it's not to actually value labor, it's just to, you know, to support society. This is, I'm talking about really valuing the labor and the work mothers are actually doing as work. I mean, motherhood is a job, many jobs. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? There's one in the chat. Handling the questions for me. I didn't have to go to Susie this week. <laughs> that was great. How you get the interview for? There's one in the chat. President says it's from David Stein. What do you uh, What do you think about expanded early childhood education and what impact it would have? Oh, I love it. I'm so excited about universal pre-K. I think it's going to have an enormous, enormous, enormous impact. Um, especially being in the education space, you know, giving children the opportunity, you know, to, to, you know, to learn fundamental things at the earliest of possible ages, you know, is, is just is critical. And again, the data is very clear, you know, it's good for society, people live longer, they're healthier, you know, it's good. So, so I, I really do hope I was excited to see that in, in President Biden's plan. And, you know, we have, you know, universal pre K here in New York City, it's been a game changer. Um, I'd like to see it everywhere in the country. Thank you, Rishma. Thank you. Thank you so much. For being our speaker today. Thank you for having me. Keep fighting. Uh -huh. This year, our club is making the homeless crisis in Oakland a priority. To that end, and as I gift to you for being our speaker for the day, in your honor, we are making a donation to support our unhoused residents in Oakland. Additionally, we would like to give you our Centennial Book, which documents 100 years of service and friendship in the third oldest club in the Rotary world. Again, thank you, Richmond, for being our speaker today. Isn't it great we can hear clapping now? We so, so many times we were on Zoom, we didn't hear any clapping. <laughs> Rotarian John Clausen, will you tell us about the speaker for next Civic Thursday meeting? John? The, okay, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay, great. Yes. Um, our speaker next week is Bruce Kwan, is a longtime friend who graduated from Skyline High School in Oakland who was the 1972 elected student body president 
at UC Berkeley. He obtained his law degree from Bolt Hall School of Law. He was one of three students nationwide chosen to clerk for the Senate Watergate Committee. He later returned to Washington in the summer of 1974 to draft the Watergate cover-up and break-in sections of the committee's final report. He worked in the city attorney's office for city of Alameda. He worked with the mayor Lionel Wilson on economic, on economic issues for Chinatown and downtown. He practiced law in San Francisco and worked on projects from uh, with Mayor Agnos. Bruce uh, almost won a seat on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Uh, he worked as a professor for Peking uh, Law School. Um, Oakland Mayor, uh, uh, it's in, in, in uh, Beijing, Oakland the Mayor Gene Quant, no relation to Bruce, told me that Bruce Quant was instrumental in finding the Chinese investors who invested $1.5 billion in Oakland for the Brooklyn Basin Project that is still being developed today. Bruce Quant has recently published his fascinating book, Bitter Roots, Five Generations of a Chinese Family America in America. It is available on Amazon. Bruce will be a great speaker next week telling about his grandparents and great-grandparents and the significant contribution they made in the San Francisco and Oakland, the whole Bay Area. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Isaac, for the thought for the day. And thank you, Karen, for the guests from Medellin. Thank you for the Salvation Army and the wonderful recognition from Rory number three. Thank you, Jesse, for the DC announcement. Thank you, Kathleen, for the gala announcement. And thank you, June Lane, for introducing such an amazing speaker and handling the question for us. Uh, before I wrap up this meeting, do we have any more bell ringers? Susan, maybe you can tell. Yes, we do. Um, we have Gail for her article in, in Piedmont Living, and Karen Friedman, Dudley Thompson, and Ruth Strop all for Gail, and Joyce C. Mack rings the bell for her mom. That's four, I think I heard you say. So I ring the bell four times. Ringing the bell is a $100 gift to the ORE uh, uh, Oakland Rotary Endowment. So we love to get those bell ringers, and thank you. Gail for giving us that opportunity to do that bill. So I'd like to end this meeting as we always do. And that's the way it went at the 5,339 club meeting on May 13, 2021 at Oakland Rotary number three, the third oldest Rotary club in the world. And for now, this meeting is adjourned.